I'm Paul Tipton, I'm president of the McKee Bridge Historical Society and we're here today at the McKee Bridge Centennial Celebration. Janine Southry, Evelyn Williams, what are you doing here? We're descendants of the McKees uh, that the bridge and, was named after. And we belong to the Historical Society. The McKee Bridge Historical Society. I came to Southern Oregon in 1972 after having been in uh, U.S. Navy Seabees for three years and made two trips to Vietnam. I grew up in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, my great-grandfather was a photographer as a boy taking pictures of the aftermath of the Civil War. I came here in 1972 to get away from the war and uh, the fact that I wasn't very well accepted in my community when I came home from Vietnam. But I've been here, I started working for the Forest Service uh, the first year that I came to Oregon and worked for the Forest Service as a seasonal employee for about six seasons and uh, worked right here in this area in the Applegate uh, drainage in the Star Ranger District. And it's actually where I met my wife and uh, we've been married now for 40 years and have three children and uh, that we've raised out in uh, the Applegate on Humbug Creek is where we live. And, We've lived there now since uh, for 40 years, actually, since 1977. Um, I came to be interested in the McKee Bridge and the Historical Society because as a boy, I grew up fishing uh, from a covered bridge right outside of Gettysburg, uh, the Sachs Covered Bridge, which is only about a mile down the road from the Eisenhower Farm. And as a boy, I really enjoyed hanging out around the bridge and fishing, and I still enjoy fishing and hanging around old bridges. The place that I grew up was a very conservative place, and I think that the West Coast in this area is a bit more liberal generally. I actually came here to visit a friend that I'd been in the service with and had been through some experiences with. He was uh, getting a teaching degree at Southern Oregon College at the time and I ended up going to college at Southern Oregon College over a number of years and eventually got a degree in creative writing uh, there at Southern Oregon State College. That was about 1984, whenever I graduated from there. Lawson's a good old friend of mine. Uh, we, we've connected a long time, actually. I did know Art. I did know Art. It was, uh, he's not involved. He's, is Art still alive? Okay, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking that he had passed. What are your memories of Lawson? Well, <laughs> He was much younger than he is today, but then so am I. <laughs> um, I remember Lawson being someone who was very open to um, most anybody in the community. He is a very open person. I, especially given what I came to find out about Lawson and everything that Lawson had been through as far as being in the the camp, uh, the internment camp in uh, Tule Lake and all of that and so that really struck me that he was uh, such a an open person given what he'd had to experience in his own life. And the spoken part of it is what I've always enjoyed as a poet myself. I've uh, enjoyed for the most part the, the spoken aspect of poetry. And I, it's nice to get your works published because more people can see them that way but they can only hear them if you speak them and uh, so I continue to be involved and Lawson actually came out to the Applegate area about a year and a half ago and uh, Joan, Jonah Peterson, you may know Joan, uh, Jonah and, and Chris are, are, uh, and Lawson are longtime friends as well and so at her urging he came out and 
uh, got a bunch of people together at the same time and so we started an Applegate Poets group and uh, so we've been doing poetry readings locally in the area and just a month and a half ago we uh, did a reading over at Bloomsbury in Ashland, a couple of readings actually, I was only in one of them. But, uh, so Lawson still continued to be an inspiration for a lot of people I think as far as all of that. and. Uh, yeah, he, he was a great influence on me at that time as far as getting into writing and through writing classes that I did with him and, uh, and, and others there at school, I eventually wrote uh, quite a bit about my Vietnam experiences, some of it published as individual poems and uh, short stories. Uh, vignettes of uh, different things. I have a, a longer body of work that I hope to put together someday, but haven't had the chance to do that at this point. Um, a lot of the stuff that I, I wrote then, and I still uh, am afflicted by it, I guess I can't seem to get away from the Vietnam experience as far as how it still affects me. I am considered a disabled veteran, and the PTSD aspect of it has certainly influenced my whole life, uh, but there's, uh, there is a certain uh, value still to me in being able to express in that way, to, to get feelings out in some sort of form that's workable, I guess. Well, I, I didn't know for sure. I hadn't been here before, so I didn't know what it was going to be, but I found Ashland to be a very liberal place, and uh, there was certainly, there had been a lot of anti-war demonstrations through the college and stuff at that time, and that was all pretty much over by the time I got there, but um, there was not as much of a, um, a prejudice, it's I guess, against those of us who had been to Vietnam simply as patriotic sons and did our duty and came back and found that people didn't want to hear about it or had already made decisions about who we were or how we were from our experience. And I, I think we were prejudged in a lot of situations. I moved into a relatively rural farming committee community, and uh, I, I had a hard time finding work in those days. I, uh, I did a lot of farm work. I actually I worked at Valley View Vineyard for about six years after Frank Wisnowski, the uh, person, the uh, man who started the vineyard there. He died in a, a diving accident uh, during the filling of Lost Creek Lake back in 1978, I believe it was, that he died. And shortly after that, I started working at Valley View, uh, picking grapes and then pruning, and eventually, uh, for a number of years, I was the farmer in the vineyard there, pretty much. I was the vineyard manager taking care of the vines there. From that, I went into some other uh, agricultural work. Uh, work was real difficult to find back during the 80s, and you kind of had to take what was available. At one point I had a job for about eight or ten months with uh, a CETA program, C-E-T-A, where I was working at the uh, what was the uh, Southern Oregon Historical Society Museum in Jacksonville, the old uh, courthouse in Jacksonville that still stands. So I had the uh, chance to be working there and be involved in uh, collections. So I was working on a lot of stuff that was behind the scenes things, going through things and inventorying them, uh, uh, trying to pr uh, preserve some things for later historical value that's just things that were stored away. And a lot of it is they have so much stuff that it can't all be displayed. And of course these days, a lot of that is in warehouses out in White City or something. It's just not in the public eye at all anymore. So um, eventually I went back to uh, doing what I'd done in my younger life. Uh, I started out doing steel work and uh, when I was uh, you know, a teenager and I worked doing steel work uh, while I was in the Navy and I was in the Navy Seabees, uh, construction battalions, and 
So I went back into construction and pretty much the rest of my uh, work life until I retired a few years ago was doing uh, construction on local houses and, and different kinds of projects, whole houses, remodels, that sort of thing. So. And I, I actually, I live in the woods. I, I live uh, in a fairly rural situation where I don't have a whole lot of other people real close around me. And I find a lot of solace in the woods, actually. The forest has uh, been a very important thing to me. The work I did with the Forest Service primarily in silviculture and uh, so in, in the, um, the study of and the work, work of getting har harvesting trees. And uh, I did some uh, fire work as well. I worked on a number of big fires that happened during the early 70s. I had the uh, interesting chance in, we had a large uh, flood in 1972-73, the winter of 72-73. Uh, flood took out a lot of the bridges uh, throughout the forest and in the local area there was a lot of damage down in Lithia Park and stuff too. So in the three or four years after the flood when those bridges weren't repaired we were often ferried into work uh, by helicopter so we get dropped in on top of a mountain and work our way down and be picked up at the end of the day. And it was a kind of a different experience for me because I'd been ferried around in Vietnam to work situations uh, in helicopters. I'd lived under 60 or 70 flying around in the air above me at times and uh, I still have a very strong hit every time I hear a helicopter blade clear the horizon it changes something for me but I, th the thing about this was it was very interesting to use the helicopter as a tool to be able to see down onto the forest to see the the shape and the lay of things to see where the roads might go to where the the cuts had already happened and all of that it was a, a very good overview because otherwise we only had stereoscopic pictures that we used to uh, be able to, to look down into a, a photo uh, of, of what was down there, but flying over it made it entirely different. Things changed as far as forest harvesting into the, from the 1970s into the 1980s. The Forest Service probably hadn't done enough work as far as um, making sure that they could, in fact, grow trees where they said they could grow trees. They uh, were harvesting at a very big rate and their justification was that by using herbicide chemicals, they could establish plantations of new trees on the areas that they had harvested. So they could clear cut an area and because they could use herbicides to manage the brush and stuff under it, their contention was that within five years they would be able to grow new trees. That was totally false and I was one of the people that was going out and collecting data on what had been done and what was going to be done. I quit working for the Forest Service in 1976. By 1979, Christopher Bratt and myself were co-chairman of Applegate Citizens Opposed to Toxic Sprays. And we were successful in writing a number of timber sale appeals that eventually led to those sales being shut down and never sold. And that eventually also led to a Forest Service wide, uh, in the western area anyhow, a ban on the use of herbicides for a number of years. So it was significant. On the other hand, there's that feeling that we were kind of part of what brought the timber economy to its knees locally. That was not our intention. We, our intention was to change it to a better managed way of doing things, something that was more thought out than the process that was happening because they were simply going out and raping whole hillsides, just taking everything, burning it, taking um, blades across it and scarifying it and uh, some of those sites probably they haven't recovered yet. Some of them from back in the 1950s that were done then still have 
big brush growing on them and very few coniferous trees. They haven't been able to reestablish those plantations still. And here we are almost 70 years out from some of that. It'll probably take hundreds of years for some of those places to regrow on their own, if they're left alone. Fishing. The two double-sided white skeletal combs dip deep through salmon pink flesh only this morning, the galley slave oars of a rainbow ship bursting forth in the depths of a lulled lake. Now, butter and mushroom and parsley and sage sauteed, the salmon pink mussels minus the two double-sided white skeletal combs feed my body, speed my journey through this life into the quiet of a lulled lake. It wasn't perfect, but it was close. 